Hi, this is the last portion of the microbial growth lecture for Bio 367. In this portion, um, I will be discussing environmental factors and the um, evolutionary adaptations that microbes have that enable them to put up with environmental stress in a variety of ways. Please listen and take detailed notes. So the environment significantly impacts microbial growth. We're going to consider temperature, pH, osmolarity, and we're not really going to talk about pressure, but we are going to talk about, um, I missed a few things on this slide here, we are going to talk about oxygen status. So we're going to talk about this, 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 and this. We're not really going to talk about pressure, but I do want you to be aware that it, that it matters. And we're not going to talk about neighbors, but I want you to be aware that that matters too. What other microbes are living in the environment um, will often dictate how many resources and whether there are toxins present or not. So they're signaling one another and they're communicating and deciding whether to grow rapidly or not to grow rapidly. So I'm not going to talk about those factors, but they are important. Let's think first about temperature. So temperature has profound impacts on organisms, including microorganisms. As temperature rises, chemical reactions, including those catalyzed by enzymes, happen at more rapid rates. This makes growth rates increase as well. Once temperatures reach a maximum temperature tolerated, and then those temperatures go beyond that point, however, you see a rapid change in the situation. Proteins will denature, and cellular macromolecules can degrade, causing cell death. And that's why we see this sharp plummet. So you see this smooth increase as reaction rates are increasing, and that causes growth to increase proportionally. But then you hit a particular temperature, and then bam, it falls off completely. It's not a bell-shaped curve. So um, once temperatures reach a maximum temperature, then they will, as I said, proteins will denature and you'll see cell death. That's what's happening in here, is death. Okay. So therefore, for each organism, there are a set of what are known as cardinal temperatures. That means a minimum temperature at which the cell can grow at all, an optimum temperature where growth rate is the highest possible for that organism, Okay, and then a maximum temperature beyond which um, you will see protein denaturation, collapse of the cytoplasmic membrane, and thermal lysis, and death. So those are the cardinal temperatures, and they will be unique for each particular species, or even subtype of species found in different environments. Let's think a little bit about the adaptations that are involved in helping organisms deal with temperature extremes. But first, actually, let's talk about how um, microbes are classified based on temperature and their growth response. So a, psych a psychrophile, actually, let me back up. The term file means, approximately means, to love. Okay? So a psychrophile is something that loves cold temperatures. And here's an organism, and there, here are its cardinal temperatures. There's its minimum, its optimum and it's maximum. And look how cold it is, right? Remember that zero is freezing. All right, so this is something that can actually grow pretty well at temperatures below the temperature that freezes water, and it grows optimally at four degrees C, which is the temperature of your refrigerator. And in fact, as soon as it gets warmer than a typical wintry day in New Hampshire, it won't grow at all. So that's this particular organism, Polaromonas faculata, is from Antarctica, and it, and it much prefers cold temperatures, and in fact it cannot tolerate um, mo even moderate temperatures. Room temperature would be way too hot for that organism. A psychotroph, in contrast, it will tolerate cold temperatures, but it grows best at moderate temperatures. Okay. Mesophiles are organisms, these would be the organisms associated with the human body and also many other environments. So for example, E. coli. 
It can grow at colder temperatures down here around 10 degrees C, but its optimum is close to 37 degrees C, which is the temperature of most um, warm-blooded mammals. The temperature extreme falls off somewhere at you know around 48 degrees, temp uh, degrees Celsius. That's the maximum. Okay. Then we're up into the thermophile world. So thermophiles like it hot. Hyperthermophiles like it really hot. So we've got um, thermophiles that have temperature optimums around 60 degrees Celsius. That's pretty warm. And then hyperthermophiles, and we see two profiles here. One for a bacterium, Thermococcus cellar and then another for an archaeon, Parolobus fumari. The extreme hypothermophiles, those that can tolerate temperatures above the boiling point of water, which is here, right? That's where water boils. So only in environments where you have high pressure do you see these circumstances. High pressure allows for temperatures that exceed the boiling point of water, and if we look at some of those uh, uh, environments we see specialized highly adapted archaea that um, are able to actually not just tolerate but survive and thrive. So it's important to note that these are growth profiles shown here so these organisms are not just tolerating these conditions they're actually growing well under these conditions. So we describe microbes according to their ability to thrive under various pH regimes. We say that neutrophiles are what like to grow in environments where the pH is greater than 5.5 and less than 8, so they ideally love 7 or neutral pH. E. coli is in that category. Acidophiles like it acidic, so they like pH less than 5.5. Here are examples of a few different organisms that fall into that group. This particular one is common in acid mine drainage. In fact, it's one of the only environments that it's been isolated from. Alkalophiles like pH greater than or equal to 8. So there are quite a few known bacteria that fall into that category. So one of the things that's really interesting is that neutrophiles, okay, this category of organism here, they will maintain an internal cellular pH okay, in their cytoplasm that's about neutral. But Studies of the acidophile and the alkalophiles, particularly the acidophiles, have shown that their internal pH is actually quite acidic. So it's something to think about. Um, another thing, there, there are a lot of, uh, another thing to think about, and in fact there are a lot of riddles associated with some of the extremophiles, such as acidophiles and alkalophiles, is to question how they're running their proton motive force. Remember what a proton motive force is? It's an accumulation of protons, or H+, outside the cytoplasmic membrane in bacteria and archaea. And if you think about, particularly an alkalophile, it's living in an environment where there's already a really low concentration of H+, on the outside. So given where it's living, how the heck does it manage to maintain a proton motive force? And that's really uh, an interesting question, and I don't have the answer for you. Scientists have not yet figured that out.